We have the official U.S. PlayStation Magazine demo disc number 55. And that's a PlayStation 2 demo disc on a DVD. So we've got uh, we've got a Maggie animation in the beginning. office. We've just temporarily lost power to our gravity generator. I was downloading this month's OPM for a sneak preview of the tons of new stuff. So much in fact I think I blew a circuit. In this issue we follow the crew of the PlayStation 2 Turing attraction to some of the events to see what it's like to have one of the coolest jobs around. Then we headed up to Crystal Dynamics for a look at Blood Omen 2, Legacy of Cain. We also packed this issue with a bunch of cool moves, demos, and downloads, so check them out! Now, I can only remember which wire goes with which. The blue with the green, or the green with the red, or was it the red with the yellow? Hmm, well, here it goes! Oops. Well, that can't be good. Where did they portray Maggie as being a bit of a klutz? Anyway, the vault. Virtua Fighter 4. I did not press the button there. It just loaded straight into that. Virtua Fighter 4. I, I don't know if... Virtua Fighter series. I don't know if for sure it was actually the first 3D fighter. But it's generally the first one that people think of. Arcade game, then Saturn game. But And a lot of people still talk about it like it was the best. Although I think it's a dead series. I don't know if there's been a Virtual Fighter game for a number of years. I tend to have thought about Tekken, this though, as being the superior rated. game. And a lot of people say, like, oh, well, the Soul Blade, Soul Calibur series, Soul Edge, whatever you want to call it, took over as being better. But it seems like a lot of the kind of... Uh, the 3D fighter craze, in a sense, has ended. Okay, so there was a Soul Calibur game a couple of years back, and there's a Tekken game that came out more recently. But they don't, they're not getting, like, all of the attention. It's Street Fighter, since Street Fighter 4, which has... Although it's a 3D fighter in the sense that it's rendered in 3D, it all exists on a 2D plane. So you have a 3D fighter that plays like a 2D fighter. Same thing with Mortal Kombat. The Mortal Kombat, since the remake... Soft reboot, rather, in 2013, 2012, 11? Hell, I don't know. Since then, it has been a 3D rendered fighter locked to a 2D plane. That seems to be where uh, fighting games have gone since then. Anyway, Draken, Draken 2. Um, this game is... You know, I'm not sure if this is a... Sony, um, oh, I'm not playing this. Oh, I am playing this. Okay. <laughs> this is an interesting game. I think I've spoken about this before. That this was a, this was a game, that, a sequel to a game that was a PC exclusive. Of course, in the era that it came out, only the PC was going to be powerful enough to play something like this. And the PlayStation 1, the N64, you know, you really couldn't get them to do this kind of thing. But you get the PlayStation 2 comes out, like, oh, well, you can you can play this kind of stuff now. So you'd think that would mean that they would port Draken to the PlayStation 2. But no, they made a sequel to the original game for the PlayStation 2, which seems really strange. Because... There wasn't a whole hell of a lot of overlap in terms of the markets for the two. So you were a console game or you were a PC game, or it's not like a lot. There were a whole hell of a lot of people who were both. So most of the people, most of the market available for Drake and Two were people who would not have played the original, and most of the people who had played the original were not going to be in the market to play the sequel. So it's kind of weird. I think this is a another. How do I lock on? I'd done it earlier. 
uh, it's a moon or something. <laughs> this game does have a kind of interesting, like, it, it's a fairly early PlayStation 1 game, and, you know, it's fairly early 3D game in general. But you didn't really see this kind of thing on consoles before, where you have the large, open, flying environment. That's not only that, but you also have the ability to land. Let's see if I can land. Nope, oh, oh, bounced off a tree. <laughs> land. Land. Oh, what'd I do? Oh, I just stalled the game out. <laughs> Kill this dragon. I, okay, I'm not sure how to land. Pressing up. There's all the... Alright, so you can actually get off. There you go. You can get off and you can, as this girl here, run around and have melee combat on the ground. And it's strange as it is, it's actually kind of impressive to have this kind of combat on the ground in this kind of environment and that he's standing on nothing then be able to mount a dragon and just fly up into the air it's actually was a bit of an accomplishment in the air you hadn't seen this kind of thing in games before you did have you did have open world uh open environments to an extent with uh like, say, Rogue Squadron or something like that, where you're flying around 3D environments and all that. But this, adding the ground component, I don't know how to take off. There we go. Adding the ground component was really a big deal. Although, I don't know if the game was ended up being that popular. It plays a little shittily. shittily. <laughs> Alright, I'm gonna... I'm gonna get off and fight these guys on foot. Ah! This is a mistake. Die, motherfucker! It's a knoll! <laughs> you know, I, even though this was a PC game before, I wonder if this was like a Sony second party game. I think maybe it might have been, and... Here's a little one and a kill. <laughs> that was the thing about Sony. They had a lot, especially in the PlayStation 1 and PlayStation 2 eras, they had a lot of... Oh, lots of stuff. Look at this shit. Bag of gold. They had a lot of these... IPs that they created or owned or financed or whatever. And unlike, say, like Nintendo, which tends to run back to the well over and over again for even shit like Kid Icarus, Sony tends to leave a lot of their stuff behind. Now, I, I don't know if this is an example of that. I don't know if Draken was a Sony owned IP, but, you know, it, it's something. This is an interesting game, I think, although I I get why as it didn't really resonate that well with people, I don't think, and wasn't that memorable, so I guess that's why we didn't see any more sequels to it. Plus, like, the weird marketability issue with the game not... people not being able to play both games. But anyway, that's, that's the demo here. I'm going to move on. Oh, okay, I save stated at a weird place. Sean Palmer's Pro Snowboarder. As I had mentioned a bunch of times before, I'll say it every time though, there was this big rush of these sort of extreme sports games in the PlayStation 1 and some degree into the PlayStation 2 lifespan. Now, they always existed. You always had, like, California games and, like, ESPN Extreme, 2 Extreme, 3 Extreme, that kind of stuff. But it was definitely Tony Hawk's Pro Skater that blew things up in the mainstream. 
Because you used to be able to, like, oh, well, you snowboarding game. Cool borders or whatever. You wouldn't have, uh, you would have a small market for it of people, like, there's not that many people in the world who are big into snowboarding, who know the professional snowboarders, who watch it all the time. Outside of the Olympics, it's a small market. So, when you go and produce a game like this, you can guarantee, like, oh, well, a relatively small number of people are going to buy into it, but we'll make the game anyway, because game development is relatively cheap. You have um, the disc-based medium of the PlayStation or the PlayStation 2 makes distribution cheaper than you'd see on, like, the N64 or the SNES or anything like that. So you can basically be assured that it's not going to cost you a whole lot. As long as development costs don't shoot out of control, you'll make your money on this. And... So even though you don't have that many people who may actually give a shit about snowboarding, you don't need a lot of people to give a shit about snowboarding. So Tony Hawk comes around, and there's not that many, like, a, a total number of people, there's not an enormous amount of people who are really big in the pro uh, skateboarding. Tony Hawk is maybe, like, the only person they can name. What's this fucking guy named Justin Case? <laughs> yeah, this is a long time ago. <laughs> anyway, I'm, I'm off track topic here. Tony Hawk, though, broke the mold, because Tony Hawk was not just a good skateboarding game, it was a good game in general, and it exploded in popularity. And it caused there to be this enormous, enormous rush of these extreme sports or alternate sports games, like snowboarding, like SSX, pool boarders, um, 1080 snowboarding, that kind of stuff. And in the, in the PlayStation 2 era, I feel like you were still in an era where development costs had not ballooned out of control to the point where something like this is no longer possible. Because you look at this right now, the PlayStation 2, of course, would cost more to develop a game than the PlayStation 1. So, you know, anything that's going to have more detail, more like higher quality sound, larger environments... That kind of stuff is going to just take more time to develop. But it had not yet ballooned out of control yet like you'd see in like the PlayStation 3, 360 era. So games like this with a relatively small market could still be made. You could make this game and you could... You could make this game and you could market it to the small audience that you had and still make... Still make your money. When you get to the PlayStation 3, the 360, the PS360 era, we'll call it. If you wanted to have a game that didn't look like shit on the console, you had to put a lot of time and resources into developing it. Perhaps too much. Too much, uh, too many resources than you could reasonably expect to get back. So it's like, well, you can just make like a low budget game for it. And people were like, well, it's small market would buy it. Like, well, it would look like shit. It would get slap, uh, slammed in the reviews. And people would people would look at it and go, well, it's a PS3 game. Why doesn't it look better? And that's why you saw, like, this kind of thing dry up. Plus, I think, also, the, the market sort of dried up. People didn't really want to see more. It, it, the market was saturated. People kind of got tired of it. I think nowadays... There's a good I good chance for a resurgence in this kind of thing, given the explosion in the popularity and the ease of use, in fact, of middleware engines like Unity or Unreal Engine, where majority of the programming is just done for you already, and you just have an editor, you uh, like uh, dial in your physics, game design, development, all that kind of stuff, and you can make a reasonable game at a relatively low budget low manpower, all that kind of stuff. But it's... Um, I don't know if we've seen that yet. What the hell is Getaru Man? <laughs> Koei. Fucking Koei. Japanese company. There is this kind of weird thing. 
But yeah, so for quite a number of years, game development was largely dominated by Japan. And a lot of the Japanese developed games found their way over to the West. And what is this? <laughs> this is weird as shit. <laughs> Uh, Japanese games found their way over to the West, but in general, you only really saw the games come over that were marketable to a Western audience. Shit like this, I guess, did come over occasionally, but god damn, this is fucking weird, and this is definitely a kind of... Oh, okay, so you... It's like a rhythm game. You trace the thing, and you tap in time with the dots. Wow, this is... I mean, it's an interesting idea. Not something that... I mean, rhythm games took a number of years. Oh, fuck. Uh... Rhythm games took a number of years to really, like, take off. You had Rock Band and Guitar Hero and stuff that really, like, uh, blew up in popularity. So, I'm not gonna... Let's get out of this. <laughs> I'm not gonna slash this too much for being weird. The game itself, but it's... Yeah, everything about it is just so viciously Japanese. It, it does not appeal to me. I'm sure there's people out there, there's Japanophiles that love everything Japanese, anime, that kind of stuff. That's not me, though. Maximo! Maximo. I remember the name, but I don't remember the game. <laughs> we are definitely at a point in these demo discs where I was no longer playing every demo disc over and over again. So I could, like, because I didn't have other games to, have to play. So when I first, I first got subscriptions to this magazine because they would issue demo discs and I didn't have a lot of money. So it would be a long span between when I'd be able to afford a game. Now, the, the magazine subscription was like $40 a year or something like that. Something pretty expensive for a magazine subscription. But it came with 12 demo discs. So, for what was essentially the cost of a new game, I get an entire year of game experiences. There's like three, four, five, six, seven, eight games per demo disc. And I get all of these different experiences that I can have for a relatively low budget. So, when I first got on the PlayStation, I didn't have many games, so I relied on those. Oh my god! I relied on those demo discs when I to have anything to play really. When uh, got the PlayStation 2, the same thing. Didn't have many games for it. Relied on the demo discs. Eventually, though, I up oh, got the key. Eventually, though, I did have enough demo discs and I did have enough games where every disc wasn't something that I spent an enormous amount of time playing because I had other stuff to play. So, a lot of these, like, I don't really remember this disc at all. Oh, I need to, I need to buy that. Shit, that's what these coins are for. I need to spend 500? Fuck that. Armor! I kind of like this era. This sort of mid-generation, I'm assuming this is mid-generation, PlayStation 2 games, like the graphics aesthetic and all that kind of thing, because in the early PlayStation 2 era, there was basically a kind of uh, era where the developers were trying to sort out how to work the machine, because its architecture was very different than the PlayStation 1. The PS1 didn't really have a proper graphics processor. Had a rasterizer and all that, but its 3D geometry and all that stuff was being calculated with a sort of 
um, extension core on the CPU. And the PS2 kind of did something similar than that with vector units, but it did have a separate graphics processor, and that it kind of complicated development. People didn't really know how to deal with that kind of thing at the time. Plus, the way its architecture was set up involved like, oh, well, a lot of graphical effects like the fog we're looking at right now. It's going to be done by, like, frame buffer effects and, and multi-pass rendering and that kind of shit. Developers didn't really know what to make of that kind of thing and had a hard time getting their heads around the idea. So, early PlayStation 1 game, or PlayStation 2 games were sort of like just PS1 games with higher detail. Higher resolution, higher uh, fidelity models. Eventually, though, uh, developers got a better handle on the machine, libraries got assembled to allow easier access to the hardware. All sorts of stuff like that. And better looking games started coming out. And this is the era that I think the PlayStation 2 really shined. Developers had a little bit of experience, they knew how to push the hardware better, you got just a better experience out of it. I think eventually towards the end of the PlayStation 2 life cycle though, you had a kind of a weird mix up of that though, because as oh, I have more than one kind of attack. Oh, I can throw the shield like uh, Rygar. <laughs> Towards the end of the PlayStation 2 life cycle, I feel like they were maybe trying to push the hardware too hard in certain respects, and textures started to look really grainy because they were they didn't have enough texture memory and stuff like that. But in this era where everything is very stylized, everything looks Oh, he lost his helmet. Everything is very stylized, everything has a certain look to it, it's interesting but not like um it's interesting but not overly realistic look at the water effects here this is definitely not how you do water animations nowadays but they're taking a because there's no like programmable shaders on the Playstation 2 they're using its ability to... Sony definitely made the PlayStation 2 with the ability to push a lot of 3D geometry, stuff like that. And animations and that kind of stuff with those vector units on the CPU. And we're looking at a mesh that is just deforming. And that's the kind of thing that PlayStation 2 was made to be able to handle. Nowadays, you do that kind of thing with, like, um, shaders stuff, but this is how you would have had to have done it on the PS2, and that's Perhaps something that was a little easier for developers to get their head around in that era, but it's definitely not like a modern way of doing things. Uh, don't wander on this ground. Oh, he's in his boxers. <laughs> I guess that's, um, I guess that means he's almost dead. You don't see that kind of thing nowadays much. I guess uh, the Soul Calibur games did something like that, where as characters take damage, their their clothes and their armor falls off. But I, it's not something you see much nowadays. I guess because um, any any game that's going to have female characters, people will accuse you of just sort of oh I'm dead. People will accuse you of just putting it in for the TNA factor. Am I back at the beginning of the game? I think it's here just for... Ah, it's a mimic! <laughs> <laughs> I think it's just in this game for the sake of, like, comedic effect. He's wearing boxer shorts with hearts on him. <laughs> oh, I can free look. Although I wish the camera would center when you do that. This fucking Xbox One controller. I got an uh, Xbox One Elite controller, whatever they call that. The this expensive as fuck controller that Xbox had. 
the Xbox One. It was like $150, and I bought it thinking like, well, I'm going to be using this a lot, so I want to have a really good controller. But god damn, this thing is ass. You release the stick, so here's an example. You release, um, I move forward, and I release the stick, and the controller has some, the control stick has some bounce to it. So the character has a tendency to turn around when I release the stick. Which is a real pain in the ass. Microsoft, you should have done a better job. You charged an ass load of money for this thing, and you couldn't even get the damn stick right. Hmm. Alright, I've I think I've got the point of this game. Capcom, right? Parappa the Rapper 2. Not a fan of Parappa the Rapper 2, and I think actually they call this Parappa the Rapper 2, but the actual Parappa the Rapper 2 was called Unjammer Lammy. Whatever, I'm not a fan of Parappa the Rapper, but it does seem like it's a Sony uh, IP, that another one that got abandoned. People seem to like this, though. I'm just not one of them. Um... All right, they're watching a movie. Up, oh, came out of the movie. Up, <laughs> oh, it was a dream, and you got noodles everywhere. And scratch offs. <laughs> I got this coupon at a burger shop. And I won a hundred year supply of noodle products. Oh. Since then, for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, I'm eating noodles. At first, I liked it. But now, I don't even want to look at it. The only thing that gets me going is the lovely, sunny, funny. And her sweet smile. I'll do anything for her. For eating noodles. Oh, and she's giving you noodles. I know. I got it. I got it. No, I can't believe. Parappa, I didn't know you were such a baby. Such a baby. Such a baby. Such a baby. <laughs> what is going on? Little did I know, this was the beginning of a long adventure. Noodles and your girlfriend thinking you're a wuss? <laughs> oh, God damn. Alright, let's get... <laughs> let's, oh, part of the screen isn't rendering. <laughs> That's a loading screen? Oh, that is obnoxious. Yeah, this is not something for me. <laughs> um, hey, I got it. <laughs> I'm not very good at these. It's not really about even about reaction time. It's about timing. It does have an interesting art style, not just in its cartooniness, but the fact that you have a 3D environment, but all of the characters are just flat billboard things. But they animate in a 3D way. So it's so, like, um, like paper characters that got cut out and are animated. And I guess maybe you could look at that and say, like, well, that was a, a side effect of the PlayStation 1 hardware where they couldn't animate a character like that, a completely 3D and articulated character, and have it look the way they wanted it to. So they go and they do this in order to kind of, in order to kind of get around that limitation. And I think that is definitely something that is lost nowadays, where you have 
so much performance and hardware, even in cheaper machines, that you can more or less just... It, just you, it's got so much power that that kind of limitation doesn't exist anymore. And it doesn't force people to be creative anymore. So back in the day, you had to work your way around the limitations. And those limitations actually kind of pushed you to try harder, pushed you to do better. And it, it, that just is gone. And I'm actually doing better than I thought I would have. Ah, I pushed the wrong button. I do find it a little irritating that all these animations and the music and stuff is going on in the background and I can't pay attention to it because I have to watch the top of the screen. I'm not doing that good though. Oh, the 3D burgers, they're weird me out. <laughs> Did I win? I think I won. Alright, let's get out of that. Frequency! Another... It's another, um... Rhythm game. The rhythm games had their market. I guess Parappa the Rapper was added its popularity, although it wasn't huge. The rhythm games didn't really take off until Guitar Hero, which was on PS2 initially. And it had a, quite a bit of popularity there, although it wasn't huge yet. Guitar Hero 3 and then Rock Band after that were the big deal. They, they were huge. And considering that the rhythm games that required... You know, whatever. Who cares? The rhythm games that required an external peripheral were always going to be more expensive because you had to buy the guitar or the drums or whatever the fuck you were playing with. So that was always going to be a barrier to entry, but they were so popular. They were so good, and they it was such a complete encapsulation of what made the rhythm games good that it managed to become popular regardless of the fact that it was such an expensive thing to get into. Whereas something like this, you just have to buy the game and you can play it with the controller. Just like Parappa the Rapper, you can just get it with the controller. I'd say maybe, well, eventually the Rock Band, Guitar Hero kind of thing faded. I think it was mostly because there was just too much saturation in the market. Too many different rock band games, too many different Guitar Hero games, too many different song packs released. People got tired of it. It was a star that burned bright, but it burned too bright and burned itself out within a few years. Although it's never going to have the same kind of popularity, I think Beat Saber is the modern evolution of the rhythm game. Of course, that's another one that's going to be have limited appeal on account that it you need a VR headset. Most people just are never going to get VR. It's more expensive than like the guitar instruments. Not everybody enjoys a VR experience. Like I have, I had a PSVR, PlayStation VR, and I liked it, but I didn't use it a whole hell of a lot. The technical limitations for it was something that just. I didn't like the screen was too low resolution. I eventually got a Rift S, Oculus Rift S, and through that I played um, Beat Saber and all of that, and it was a great game and all that, and I liked it, but eventually I got tired of that as well. Beat Saber, if you're not aware, is a VR game where it's a rhythm game where you have a lightsaber and you're smacking things out of the sky to the tune of music. And that, that is uh, probably like, although it doesn't feel like you're playing a musical instrument, it does feel like a more immersive experience because it's in VR, you know, compared to 
rock band, Guitar Hero, Frequency, Per Rap of the Rapper, or whatever. I never really liked these kinds of games until Guitar Hero. It just... The, the controller interface just doesn't do anything for me. I'm just timing button presses. That's not... Actually, doing better than I thought I would have. I was never very good at Guitar Hero. I was never very good at Beat Saber either. Or any of these games. But I was alright. Considering the years since I played Frequency. Never owned Frequency, but I do remember playing this demo. How everybody was ranting and raving about how great it was. I had to give it a try, and like. Didn't really like it, but I figured, like, well, there's got to be something here. Let me just give it its due effort and see if it does something for me, and it never really did. Been years. I, f I guess it's been years. <laughs> but the gameplay is simple enough that... Oh, I won. But it's still going. God, these little dots are hard to see. Tone down the friggin' particle effects. Oh, it is over. This is just some weird shit that happens at the end. Alright, moving on. Soul Reaver 2, is this a demo? Yes, it is a demo. I don't remember there being a demo to Soul Reaver 2. Soul Reaver is a part of the Legacy of Kane series, so originally it was supposed to be the Blood Omen series. I've played all of these games on this channel, so if you want to go check them out, go watch those videos. They're only 60% terrible. The brainchild of Dennis Dyack and Amy Henning before her Uncharted days. The, um... Legacy of Kane series was... A story about a vampire named Cain who comes, basically goes on a journey. It's too much to describe here, but he ends up becoming a sort of godlike figure. And you play as, in this game anyway, you play as this um, vampire lieutenant of his named Raziel, who he, that who Cain had had executed. And he was resurrected as this kind of wraith who is on a journey to get vengeance against Cain. Now, during the journey, you find out, it's like, oh, well, there's a lot more going on than Raziel realizes, and Cain has a bigger picture in mind, and he's trying to break fate's mold or something like that. And this demo is not loading. Okay, unfortunately, Legacy of Cain, Soul Reaver 2, we will not be able to experience here. Want to see it, though, go watch my videos. Air Blade. Is this, like, Kinetica? See. Namco! Pac-Man! <laughs> Sony Computer... Licensed by Sony Computer Entertainment Europe. So is this a second party game, I guess? Renderware, that was a game engine. Single player. Story mode. Downtown. Grab, grind, jump, hold... Let me info on where I have taken Oscar. Somebody's been kidnapped? And we're gonna skateboard? We got a hoverboard. Look at that shit. <laughs> Marty would be fucking proud. Oh my god, this controls like shit. Oh my god. Like, I push the stick to the side and the dude just turns all the way. So you gotta... Oh, jeez. This controls like ass. <laughs> Alright, I'm getting the hang of it. You gotta have minor, minor, um, minor, very minor, very slight, very short adjustments to your direction. Because if you just point the stick in one direction or the other, the dude just turns all the way in that direction. It's freaking terrible. Alright, I'm getting the hang of it, I think. Like I was saying before, the 
I mean, though, this isn't a... This isn't a, like, skateboarding game. It is a skateboarding game, but not a skateboarding game. There's no... I'm going to assume that this guy isn't a pro skateboarder that people might recognize. This really is just playing off the popularity of Tony Hawk Pro Skater. Well, like I was saying before, though... Oh, that dude just bumped out of the way. Like I was saying before, though, the PlayStation 2 was still within the era where you could... You could reliably, uh... make a game on a relatively low budget that is up to, like, the visual standards of the era and without it costing you a fucking enormous amount of money in terms of development costs. And the relatively small market that you were going to... What am I supposed to do with this thing? It's pointing me towards that billboard. Am I supposed to get on top of it? I don't know how to get up there. The relatively small market you would have for something like this would be enough that you can get people to experiment. The developers would be willing to experiment. And for the most part, you only see this kind of experimentation on in the indie scene. Oh, shit. Okay, I went through it. Oh, I gotta destroy billboards. Okay. Why didn't I destroy it before? I ran into it a few times. There's another one. How the fuck am I supposed to get up there? Oh, there's a ramp. Okay. Development could be done on a budget, and you would be able to get enough of a market to... You can get enough of a market to make something like this worth it. Ugh, fuck, this game is ass. Alright, I'm moving on. <laughs> I Heat Major League Baseball 2003, these fucking weird licensed sports games. <laughs> Developed by who the hell knows what. Nowadays, a 3DO company. Shit, that was still around? In the PS2 era? So, the... Nowadays, the licensing for these sports games has been narrowed down to like individual things so there's one mlb game every year and it's developed by sony although there is an xbox version of it nowadays there's one nfl game and it's madden there's one nba game the, the licensing got narrowed down it's not licensed to multiple things and and you don't really have developers going and oh a lefty i guess i'm the batter and I struck. <laughs> you don't really have developers going and making like unlicensed baseball, unlicensed basketball. Well, maybe a little basketball, but I suck. You're not having unlicensed sports games really on the market. It's not as many anyway. And you're not having multiple like MLB licensed games. Fuck, I am bad. What is happening? Game doesn't look that great either. Look at their faces. It's freaking me out. Dude, you can move around the batter's box a little bit if you want. I'm just going to strike out. I'm not even close to hitting. There we go. And I'm out. Fuck. All right, let me try pitching. How am I going to do it from the same perspective? Ah, uh, why are you so much better at this than me? Uh, you're out anyway. Anyway, well, we get the point. <laughs> This video is going on for quite a while. Hurdy Gurdy. This was a thing we had seen a demo in an earlier episode of this uh, video series, so I probably did like the next like demo disc 56 or something. I guess it's a Sony first or second party game. 
another example of Sony having you know, lots of IPs that they don't use nowadays. They like they make one or two games and they let them sit in the past. It's this interesting little game that I didn't really enjoy, where you just herd animals and dodge enemies. I guess. Like I said before, it was during the era where you would see a lot of experimentation out of Sony throwing everything at the wall and seeing what stuck because game development wasn't really expensive. So expensive that they couldn't afford to do it. Nowadays, experimentation seems to be brought down to a minimum. Sony does, to give them credit, allow their first party studios a lot of freedom to spend as much time as they need to make any game. Like, oh, well, uh, the Uncharted game is going to take an extra year development. Give it to them. Uh, whatever. Like, the next Horizon game is going to take a long time to develop. Let them have the time. And when these games do come out, they tend to be very good. But they're all sort of coming down to being the same formula over and over again. High quality, but sort of third-person, over-the-shoulder shooter, melee fighter kind of thing. Like Uncharted, Spider... I mean, as, as very different as those kinds of games are, like, there's definitely DNA of Uncharted, of The Last of Us, of um, God of War. Very, like, this similar DNA in all of those games nowadays. So it is kind of unfortunate that the era of experimentation with Sony has passed. I think maybe Sony should consider allowing some of their smaller studios to go back to developing smaller games, not trying to... Like, okay, of course, you're going to want your, un your, um, your naughty dogs and your gorillas to go and make the big tentpole games. But let some of your smaller studios just go and say, hey, you know what? Make a little, like, uh, not a AAA game. Something that is just... A little release will charge you $40 for it. It'll go on the market. Just take a year or two making a smaller game. and Experiment. See what works. Oh, so this was not Sony. This was Core, which was under Eidos. So this wasn't Sony at all. What the hell am I talking about? Well, my point still stands, even though it was Eidos that did it. Or well, Court under Eidos. Smugglers Run 2. Never played it. Uncertainty in the former Soviet Union persists. I did have Smugglers Run 1. One. Smugglers Run 1. Was a game that I had and I very much enjoyed because that was... You are smugglers. A, um... An early PlayStation 2 game. I was a fairly early PlayStation 2 adopter. What do you know that I don't? And one of the first games that I got... Not the first, but one of the first was Smuggler's Run. Because even though the game didn't really have a whole hell of a lot to it, what it did have was a bit of a technical marvel for its era in, in a large open environment with a long draw distance. So, especially on the PlayStation 1, racing games weren't open, and they tended to either have, like, pop-in, fog obscuring, like, things that are far away, or the courses were made with these narrow sort of turns and stuff where you wouldn't have to see too far off into the distance, making everything feel kind of claustrophobic. Smuggler's Run, on the other hand, pushed the draw distance way out, further than any game that I'd seen before, I think, and it was really impressive. The game itself, you know, it was alright wasn't fantastic. It was alright, though. But the sort of value of it came from being something that you really hadn't seen before. Nowadays, going back to it, it's going to feel like trash. Because that technical marvel doesn't exist. You're not looking at it going... Smuggler's Run 2 comes out. I didn't feel the need to pick it up because, as I said before, money was expensive. I didn't have a lot of it. And I had to pick and choose the games that I bought, like, very selectively. Grand Theft Auto 3, holy shit, was this an influential game. Grand Theft Auto 
was like a PS1 and there was a PC version. I remember my sister had a boyfriend who showed me Grand Theft Auto 1 on his laptop. And I was like, yeah, that's interesting. You have the mission structure, you have the violence, all that kind of stuff. But take a look at this. And I show him um, Driver on the PlayStation 1, which itself was a technical marvel on that machine. 3D open environment where you can drive around and it's it looked awesome for its day looked better and I'd say even played better than the early GTA games but then Grand Theft Auto 3 hits the market and god damn it was amazing it's very dated nowadays its design is dated you can't really do a lot in the open world but it at the time it was truly something special now, I remember before it released, I was looking at pre-release screenshots and all that kind of stuff and thinking, this game's got potential, but I remember a lot of people I talked to about it weren't excited. My buddy Jose, I'd shown him screenshots for it and like, look at this game, this is going to be big. And he looks at it and goes, oh, those graphics, they're, they're hideous. It's like, like they were hurting his eyes, the freaking guy. <laughs> and... <laughs> I'm like, dude, it's an open world game, although I don't think I used that terminology. Like, it's an open world game. Like, graphical fidelity has to take a hit when you have an open world game. It's just the way it works. Like, the fact that it looks this good, but just huge open environment, though, that is something. And what do you know, Grand Theft Auto 3 was something. And they had just improved on it with the iterations that came after that. So, GTA 3 tried playing through it. Playing it with um, that HD remaster, HD thing that they did a couple of years back that was trash. And it wasn't just because the game was ugly. The enhancements they put into it did not really do the game any favors. It was just the game was so dated. It, it As revolutionary as it was at the time, games moved beyond it so quickly that it does not hold up. So Grand Theft Auto 3, amazing game for its era, not so amazing now. Yeah, I guess you can get some fun out of it, but like I couldn't stand playing it for more than a few minutes. I'd say, I'd say maybe San Andreas is probably the oldest GTA game that I could play and really get a sense of like the same kind of joy I had when I played it originally. GTA 6 got announced. I mean actually like announced there's a trailer for it god it's gonna take more than a year for it to come out though jeez it's been by the time that comes out 12 years would have passed since G since gta 5 12 years god damn game development is getting out of control there were three grand theft auto games on the playstation 2 gta 3 vice city san andreas for playstation 3 and 360 the ps360 two Plus Red Dead Redemption. And then the PS4, Xbox One generation comes out. Donut. None. And then the PS5 comes out. The Xbox Series X comes out. And what is it? Four freaking years into that generation before we see one? Developers need to, to take a step back. Look at what they're trying to do. Look at the cost of doing everything. Look how much time it takes to do everything and say, hey, get, get, you know what? Not everything needs to have frigging, frigging, um, such realistic graphics. Nothing, not everything has to be a technical marvel. The machines are powerful enough nowadays that you can make a good enough looking game and not dump an enormous amount of technical resources into doing it. You don't have to push the envelope with every goddamn thing in the world. Now, of course, Rockstar is one of the biggest development studios, has like almost infinite resources to produce their games, so they're going to do what they're going to do. But, like, here's, here's how I look at it. Look at what Capcom is doing with the Resident Evil series. 2019, you had Resident Evil 2 Remake. Um, when year did the Resident Evil 7 come out? Let's, let's say 2017 or 2018. Every year or every other year, they're putting out another Resident Evil game. And you know what? Since Resident Evil 7, they have looked better. 
they're, they're looking better now. The Resident Evil 4 remake does look better than Resident Evil 7, but not an enormous amount better. And you know what? It's fine. It looks good enough. It gets us crossed what it's trying to do. It is visually appealing enough. It doesn't have to just push the envelope in every way. And I think that's what developers need to get their heads around. You don't need to be a groundbreaking, amazing looking game with every single release. I know they say AAA has to look visually impressive, but things are good enough. Let it go. GTA 6 should not have taken 12 fucking years to develop. Anyway, this video has gone on for too long and I've been bitching about a game that's not even on this disc. Uh, I have to end this one and the next episode we will dive into the extra stuff in this uh, on this demo disc.